Hi, this is Robin Harford from eatweeds.co.uk and I'm sitting here in Kew Botanic Gardens in London with... Łukasz Łuczaj. I'm an ethnobotanist from Poland. So I'm interested for the readers really to... What is ethnobotany? Because as foragers and herbal medicine, the term ethnobotany comes in and comes around quite a lot. But I don't think most people know what it means. Can you give us a one or two sentence yeah. definition? Ethnobotany is a science which studies the relationships between humans and the plants and the importance of plants in culture and, um, and uh, how people you know, utilize them. Unfortunately, sometimes the term ethnobotany is used uh, in a vulgar sense to describe people who search for drugs and um, who seek recreation only or special experiences. Actually, the term is very broad, but uh, we use it specifically for people who document this knowledge because everyone uses plants. So in a way, you, you cannot say that someone who is using... Uh, chamomile trees and ethnobotanists, but they they sometimes use the knowledge which was documented by ethnobotanists or reinvented. Or there are a lot of issues um, connected with ethnobotany. Is uh, one is uh, preserving the traditional ecological knowledge that people have in different countries and the knowledge which is passed from generation to generation uh, orally, and it's uh, in, the, in danger of disappearance. So it's in, so I mean I know that in England we have an ethnobotany degree down at Kent, yes. which is under threat from from closure. So which is very unique, and I think it should be preserved because uh, this is a very unique place to actually study, and I'm sure if and it's well well known in many other countries. And the reason why people from other countries don't come is usually purely financial. But it, I think it gives um, wonderful opportunities for the scholars to work together and meet and for the students to get uh, proper training, you know. Because in, in, in ethnobotany, it's a very multidisciplinary thing. And people, usually people who do it, they are not like very young people after college. They, they have some life experience because you have to combine the biological knowledge, the knowledge of taxa or the awareness, even basic awareness about the phytochemistry of plants and uh, the knowledge about culture. Um, So usually it's like a second degree people do or something they do later in life. And um, But also the way the knowledge is um, documented is an art to do it because you have to talk to people, you have to record the knowledge, you have to know when to finish your study, when to, you know, how to ask people, how to approach them. And it's best when it's done uh, from person to person, when you are taught actually by people specializing in it and you don't have to reinvent it and read books about it. Yeah. yeah. So my, I mean, one of my, my interests is, because I'm not an ethnobotanist with degree, I mean, I would describe myself as an ethnobotanical researcher, so I have gone into forests and, and recorded the uses, but there are very specific ways to do that, aren't there? So, yes. So there is. So the kind of observer bias doesn't come in, and we're actually documenting the more precise. The knowledge. observer bias can always come in, and sometimes it's difficult to avoid it. But um, what is if if this is a message for amateur ethnobotanists? If yeah. you are an amateur ethnobotanist actually stumbling upon some amazing piece of knowledge in some country and you want to document it in a, in a good cause, not to make profit on some community, some tribe which is yeah. called biopiracy, sure. but just to, you know, to preserve it, to give it back to the people or to just, just share it if the, if the, the people interested are let you. Um, I would uh, advise to do it uh, anyway, just just not to in you know to do it uh, like uh, in detail. Yeah, no, just provide as as much detail as possible. Uh, like for example, it's like a in a way you can you can describe it like a crime scene or something that you know something is done in this place and uh, in this time this is something which is done now or used to be done 20 years ago this is done by a group of people in this and this village or in, it is done by one person in this village or it's a widespread tradition in some you know in some area country region 
and it's good to get the material evidence. As I said, this is like police work. Sure. You get specimens, you get evidence, so you get the products, you get the plants, you, you dry the plants, you send them to some herbarium. So it's important when, when one is recording to, to make a, a herbarium specimen, yeah? It is vi- of vital importance yeah. because sometimes there are mistakes in, in identification and, and also often the most interesting plants used are the plants which are little known. They can be actually not the plant that you think it is. And now with... Uh, and herbarium specimens are still very important because uh, now we have DNA analysis possibilities and we can just take a, 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 a break a piece of leaf from, from a herbarium specimen and make very good identification. Yeah. So they're actually more important than in the past. Yeah, yeah. So I'm interested by you because I know that you have been prolific and are prolific in the amount of research and, and the, the body of work. How <coughs> did you come to, to, to ethnobotany? What, yeah, what, where is, did the passion... I'm always interested in Well, the passion. the passion was hidden in the childhood because I was watching all these programs about tribes and that use this new bow drill and etc but uh, as an ethnobot I, I was a, I was trained as a botanist and um, I became interested in foraging and getting wild food and I left the, the academia with the intention of never going back because I <laughs> in a way I'm divided I hated this world of ambition ego you know projects grants etc but I am kind of connected to it now again but at some point I left it I did PhD and um, I moved to the countryside I started uh, just foraging myself then teaching people a little bit getting various jobs to you know get money for living Uh, had a little child etc like many other young people yeah who want to be freelance and don't want to be tied to nine to five jobs and I came to live in the countryside. And f- at first, these people who were there, they were annoying. They were, they were drunks. They were trying to steal things. They were trying to exploit me. But then I realized also the other, the good side of them, that they could cope in any situation. They could make tools of any things. They knew, um, they, um, knew which wood could be used for which tool. And they collected some herbs. And I started asking, asking them stories. And this is where it clicked. And also, I started searching for, in my foraging practice, I started reaching out for information, started looking for information about the use of plants by Native Americans and the Chinese. And this was the beginning of the internet, so it was easier and easier to get this information. So what was this, late 1990s? It was early 21st century, I would say, but... uh, you know, um, and then I became aware that there are are these people at Nobotanis who actually document this knowledge. And I was already, like, living in the countryside foraging for um, a good, you know, four or five years or even more and thinking, okay, I'll get this knowledge. I teach lo- people locally, but maybe I'm wasting my life. Maybe my... Um, actually, I should do something more than just hiding from people in the forest. And I started um, searching. I actually was... Uh, I got a part-time job teaching... Um, uh, cultural anthropology in a, in a small college in rural Poland and I had this lecture about traditional foods and I started searching Polish ethnographic literature and I found these amazing little papers that no one knows about read by like a few people in some really regional journals about the traditional use of famine plants and I started digging and digging and digging and finding so famine, like famine plants, sorry, famine plants used in Poland. Soviet, Soviet times? Are we talking no, no, earlier? 19th century, okay. May, end of 19th century. Yeah. You know, like in you had Irish famine, like yeah. we had also some kind of similar famines, yeah. and uh, yeah, and it was great. And I found like you know manuscripts actually, which are not published, not known, reporting the use of plants, and. That was a time when my children were small and um, I couldn't really travel a lot and I didn't have a lot of money. So, in a way, going to local archives and taking pictures of archives and then sitting at home in winter by the fire and, and extracting the information was possible for me. So, a lot of my papers from the beginning are like this. Wow, okay. And then, um, and, and then I was just contacted by a univer- local university. They just phoned me and said, could you work for us? Because we see you publish a lot, and 
it counts for us. Wow. So they just employed me. Wow. And uh, now they give me money for research, so so, so I continue. So, I mean, I, I know you through the research papers you put out on wild edible plants, famine foods, as you say. Is there, are you, is that... Is that an area that you, you will focus on for the rest of your life, or is, is your ethnobotanical exploration I, going into new areas? My bot- ex- ethnobotanical exploration goes to other areas as well, but um, this is the stem of my research. It's like a tree has... I'm a kind of tree that maybe has one or a few stems, but there are some kind of stems, you know, and this is just uh, the mainstream of what I do. But I'm also interested in ritual plants, in magic plants, and did a lot of papers about it and about the use of plants in children and construction plants. I like also architecture and making buildings, etc. So there are different different things, but I, I think that um, sometimes um, it's good to focus. We are living in the times that people are distracted and I get distracted. Yeah. You open Facebook, you open this and people click, click and they write to you and then you re- realize you wasted 70% of your daily time by doing things that you didn't have to do and actually focus. I think in these, in, 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 in these times when we get this information, the heroes now are the people who can focus in spite of social media and do their stuff. And um, so I don't find doing just one thing boring. I, th- I think this is like, um, uh, what you call it in English? Um, Discipline. Not discipline, when the destiny, your life destiny. Yeah. You discover yeah. your, what is your purpose in life and you do it. And I think it's great. And my, I, I did field research in a few countries in, of Eurasia uh, because I was really interested to look personally how people use plants in different communities because we can read papers written by different scholars and they will report interesting things and lists of plants and but when one person when the same person goes to different places you can get really a comparison because you saw it yourself it's not that you read it but you can see the extent of using something and um, I know a, a lot of ethnobotanists who do it the other way around they specialize in the regions someone lives in China they study Chinese plants someone lives in Spain they spend their whole life studying food plants, medicinal plants, tool plants of Spain. But my destiny is different, to study wild foods, but go like a pilgrim from village to village around the world. And once you've gathered more countries, more data, it, it's amazing, actually. You can see things that, oh God, you didn't expect, that the, the, actual, the attitude of people is so different, you know. Like you go to a Chinese village in the mountains and people don't eat fruits very much. Only a little bit and only as medicine. And if you tell them that in Europe we make preserves from fruits, they laugh. They say, what would you make these preserves? But I said, but no, because they are tasty, but they're too sweet. Or they say, but you waste sugar. Why would you waste sugar to make preserves? Yeah. Uh, we collect wild vegetables. They are healthy. They are nutritious. They are tasty. It's it's really really different, and uh, I think it's worth comparing. So, for people listening to this show, who are not maybe academics necessarily, <coughs> um, and have an interest, maybe their interest in plants has started with a bit of foraging or with a bit of herbal medicine. Um, what would be your advice to them for for going a bit deeper? That's a very good question. One question is to know Latin names of plants because uh, you can get really useful things in scientific literature, but you have to really know the the names of plants and um, uh, Latin names of plants. And also to use uh, Scholar Google. There is a, a, a branch of Google called Scholar Google where you can search articles and you can find um, interesting articles which are a bit hermetic, written with a bit hermetic language, but once the no- you know the Latin names, you have the raw data, yeah? And then you can judge, because uh, someone could say, this uh, plant A is used in China. But sometimes it means that one, some one guy went to one village in China and he, he interviewed 50 people, and two people mentioned that they use this plant. So uh, if you state that 
a plant A is used in a country B, it can mean very different things. It can mean that it's used by people, maybe they just invented it recently, or maybe it's a relic use of one or two people, but some plants are really widely used. And surprisingly, there are plants which are uh, widely used in some countries still now, and, and they are plants that we would never think they would use, like in Georgia, in, in Caucasus. People um, in the region of Imereti, people still widely uh, eat comfrey in buttercups, like spinach. You would see buttercups sold in the market wow. and people buying, buying them and cooking them for half an hour and then mixing with walnuts and, and eating them. And so Whereas over here, that's over kind of, here buttercup is kind of... was never the used. In, in Poland, buttercups were eaten until the, eight, the 19th century. And these are the, the young green leaf. Young green leaves, and um, you can actually use any kind of buttercup, but you would have to boil them for a very long time or dry them. But some of them are less toxic, some some more. But sure. basically, so there are still uh, places that people uh, use um, interesting wild plants wildly, and it's not uh, like a relic use. Yeah. Yeah. You go to Greece, you go to Croatian islands, you go to Italy, and you might be really surprised. I think what for me that's what I find that's the part of ethnobotany as as an amateur ethnobotanist myself that's the side of it that that I find fascinating you mentioned it a bit like a crime scene I describe it as like being a detective and and that I can look at different cultures and visit at different cultures and what happens is the story of one plant becomes far larger than just the story of that plant within my culture so it's the kind of the, the cross-cultural story that makes up that, that one plant. Just to say the story of, a, of the human being in England is, ha, contributes to the whole human story with Africa, African humans or Chinese humans or South American yeah, humans. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's a fuller picture when we learn about one plant yeah. and also you, you when you study the traditional use of plants you learn the um, i would say um the cultural background you know yeah. that's what happens with drugs the drugs are dangerous because they are taken outside their okay. their background as a ritual as a plant that helps you maybe in one time in life and not like a something you take all the time yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, when, when we were just having, having lunch with some, some fellow plant <coughs> fanatics and, and that, you know, the question of, oh, when you ask me when Plants and Healers International take people into Peru, you know, oh, is, it, is it for ayahuasca? And, and my frustration is that, you know, everyone goes there to take ayahuasca and yet there's, you know, that's one small aspect of that culture in context. And yet the plant stories are so much larger than just as I say going into the forest to get stoned yeah it's actually a, I think it's actually pretty rude to go to a culture and just focus on that one side the sacrament side when there's so many other uses within the culture of the variety of plants that we find yeah and um, like um Sometimes you discover little things that you that they fascinate you. Like I, I, in Georgia, I studied the the use of wild plants to make these um, uh, bowls called pchali. They are boiled um, plants mixed with crushed walnuts yeah. and made like bowls like ice cream. And people often use um, they put four seeds of pomegranate on top. Okay. And I asked people, why do you do it? They said, we don't know. My mother did it. And so. It fascinates me. It's like magic, you know. People like put yeah. four seeds of pomegranate. Why four? Why in this shape? You know. And there are many these kind of relics of some old traditions and customs. You know, like. Uh, Did you find out? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> not yet. But um, like uh, one of the I think most useful things I learned about using wild uh, vegetables in Croatia is uh, looking at old ladies going with knives and collecting dandelions in spring. And they told me, you have to do it with a knife, not with the hand, because okay. if you do it with the hand, you pull the single leaves. And when you do it with a knife, you cut it below the, the place where the rosette is formed, yeah. and you can collect like 20, 50 leaves in one 
go and then they don't mix and you bring it in but in the basket like mushrooms and you can see aha this is dandelion this is wild chicory this yeah, is this yeah, yeah. and I learned these small little details you know so that's almost like I mean just that aspect is is another is a gathering protocol isn't it yeah of of that particular culture yeah because over here you know you can go to certain parts of the country and everyone says no you take one dandelion leaf from there and one dandelion leaf from over there and that's fine when you when you've got the luxury of a supermarket down the road yeah but if you're actually trying to feed yourself without that luxury yeah 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 then streamlining it is pretty important so do you still think it's valid that people say in England um talk to the old people in their community to find out the uses of plants or do you think that's kind of been done and dusted in the document no in England it's very difficult but I think that you would, there would be still interesting people to talk about in the in the northern Scotland or on the islands or or somewhere some relics I I, I, I still think there are like people like this I still believe in ethnob- ethnobotany of England you yeah. know I do as well I, uh, really you have to really get to people it's more difficult also because the British people have a big sense of privacy. I cannot imagine knocking at people. I do it in many <laughs> countries. We knock at people's doors and ask them questions. I wouldn't do it here. I would be scared. But uh, um, Shotgun yeah, I, would go, I would go down a pub and maybe shout, hey, guys, do you know anyone who knows plants? Yeah. Yeah. Actually, a lot of the uses that I found when... When I used to drink and I used to go to pubs, is that that was one of my first port of calls would be the local pub. Yeah. Because I'd go in and then the discussion would start. And I'd say, well, I'm interested in plants and how plants have been used as food and medicine. And, and just from that opening conversation, I'm then introduced to some old deer who's yes. lived in the region all her life, never gone out of it. And actually, that's where you get those choice bits of, of information. And you actually embed within a culture very quickly. That's why I like going abroad. As soon as I mentioned, I remember hitting Burma, and as soon as I hit there and said I was interested in forest food, I mean, I couldn't get more than enough people. They were all coming out to, to want to show me because no one normally asks those questions from people in different cultures. So I suppose if there's any encouragement from this interview, is that is that wherever you find yourself, try and find the people that still have the plant knowledge. Yes. yes. And document it. Yes. You know, it's, uh, you know, it's, um, for me, it's also the way, the, the way of, of looking at um, different cultures. I never go on holidays as on holidays because they're utmostly boring compared to, to my research, yeah? yeah? I can make a day break to swim in the sea or something, but this is all. Because by these uh, encounters with people, you go to such places that you would never go. You're invited to places that you would never you know, end up in... Yeah. And we are, just to wind it up, because I know you have a, have a meeting pretty in a, in a few moments, that we are sitting here in queue. Yes. And for anyone listening it's to a this, lovely if place. you haven't been here, you must it's, book at least two days here. It's an amazing minimum. place. Yeah. Yes. So, I, I, this morning I spent two hours in the acorn col- in the oak collection, just going from oak oak tree to oak tree and looking at acorns and wow. and leaves and you know. Wow. Well, thank you very much. Short and sweet, and you are doing the annual ethnobotany lecture tonight. Yeah, which is a great privilege for me actually to be here at Q and. Um, be the main speaker of the day you know and um, and what are you talking on I'm talking about uh, the topic of my lecture is can we find new edible species in Europe wow okay yeah can we actually find species which are not reported in ethnographic sources and are edible and would I would if I'm able to record it can that be added to this interview yes yes of course can be connected that would be brilliant wonderful thank you so much thank you